Stefan and Sean and Kendra come on up and it's a chance for you to share what happened. This has been a, quite a week. I am not sure how we were all standing upright at this point. <laughs> <laughs> we were very blessed to get to go to Cedar Bible, Cedar Canyon Bible Camp this week, and it was such a long drive there, but I was so worried because I had the girls in my part, and I know we all think that girls talk all the time, but the girls I have aren't huge talkers, but there was not one moment of silence in our vehicle, and they were so just, I mean, they questioned everything, and they asked so many questions, and I just felt so blessed that I was able to drive the girls. Um, I had a not so great blessing to drive the boys back from Cedar Canyon to Rapid. That is not as great as driving the girls. I'm just saying I love y'all, but <laughs> girls rock. Um, so um, while we were at Cedar, it, it's just this canyon in the middle of um, nowhere, literally nowhere. And um, there's no cell phone service. There's no TVs. Um, we have music that we have for worship. Um, but that's all we have. We have each other, and we had God, and we had the Holy Spirit working through us, and it was just an absolute amazing blessing, and um, I just hope that we can take more with us next year for sure. Kendra gets to go for me. Tell us what you thought, what you had. Um, it was really fun. And... <laughs> Kendra. <laughs> Well, it was my uh, second year at camp, and the first year, it was kind of different. I mean, I got the same message, and it was a lot of fun, but uh, I kind of stayed in my shell a little bit. Now, the second year, this year, I went and I kind of branched out, um, and that was a lot more fun. I, I built a lot of bonds with a lot of people there, um, made some really good friendships while I was there, and um, through those friendships really uh, strengthened my faith. Um, it's pretty easy to get distracted in the outside world with uh, all the things, you know, the music, TV, um, just internet, everything, Facebook, Twitter, and all that stuff. It's really easy to get uh, distracted and get off track with your faith. And uh, going back to that camp and meeting those people and building those bonds really helped strengthen my faith again. And it also helped me um, get back on that straight and narrow path that uh, God laid out for us. And... Um, Help me stay that way, and um, now that I've got those new friends, you know, it's a lot easier. They're holding me accountable for doing my devotions, and I do the same for them. Um, it was just a major blessing to go on that trip. Um, I also want to say that one thing that I challenge these kids with is that while we're on a, um, while we're on such a spiritual high in this canyon with all of our friends who all believe, and, and just, they believe like us, and they, and they, um, we pray together and we worship together and we hold each other when we're crying. And I just asked my group of people that we took, we took eight up, that um, we just stay spiritually connected through the community in Cheyenne Wells. And we, we become a personal mission. We take that mission to school and we take that mission to our family. And we take that mission to our church and we just be our standing stone so that God knows that um, we're doing everything we can and people want to be like us and want to be Christians. And so I just ask for you guys, I ask a challenge for you to keep us all accountable and keep, keep these kids, these youth, they're, they're amazing people. And you just keep them high on this spiritual high and, you know, just surround them with your love and compassion because right now it's a tough time for them and they really need that. So thank you. Thank you. And the people said, Amen. The Hebrew lesson this morning comes from Genesis 32, verses 22 through 31. Jacob wrestles with God. Jacob got up during the night, took his two wives, his two women, women servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed the Jabbok River's shallow water. He took them and everything that belonged to him, and he helped them across the river. But Jacob stayed apart by himself, and a man wrestled with him until dawn broke. When the man saw that he couldn't defeat Jacob, he grabbed Jacob's thigh and tore a muscle in Jacob's thigh as he wrestled with him. The man said, Let me go because the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I won't let you go until you bless me. He said to Jacob, What's your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name won't be Jacob any longer, but Israel, because you struggled with God and with men and won. Jacob also asked and said, Tell me your name. But he said, 
Why do you ask for my name? And he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Penuel because I've seen God face to face and my life has been saved. The sun rose as Jacob passed Penuel, limping because of his thigh. The word of God for the people of God. I was looking up wrestling with God on the internet and I found this just to keep in mind. <laughs> That's not going to be a fair fight, is it? If it is a fair fight, we know who's helping along. This is the third sermon in a series called The Chronicles of Freedom. I'm calling it The Struggle for Freedom. You've certainly heard a lot of things about our national freedom, our cultural freedom, our political freedom, world freedom, a struggle for that. But I'm going to talk about something else. I'm going to talk about a freedom that's deep inside of you and me. There's a fellow by the name of Eckhart Tolle. He is about my age, maybe a little older. Uh, when he was 29, he had a suicidal depression. He was at the end of his rope and one night he could not get to sleep and he said to himself I can't live with myself anymore and then he stopped and he suddenly asked wait a second who is me and who is myself and what difference does it make have you ever asked yourself that question when you say, I, I, I can't stand myself anymore, or I can't believe myself? Who is that myself that you can't believe? It's like you've got two entities inside of you. Well, for, for Tolly, it was a matter of suddenly realizing that this was an unanswerable question, and he just dropped into a quiet void, and all of that tension and struggle melted away. And he woke up the next morning with what we would call the peace that passes understanding. He was free from that constant tension inside of himself. Today we talk about Jacob. Jacob. His name sounds like Yaakob, which is Hebrew for takes, gets, grasps. You remember he was born grasping his older brother's heel. His, his twin brother came out and then here comes Jacob hanging on to his heel. And then he grasped his older brother's birthright. And then he grasped his older brother's blessing, stole it from him. And his older brother was ready to kill him, so Jacob hightails it to Uncle, La Uncle Laban's place. He meets the girl of his dreams at the well. And it turns out that that's her father, Uncle Laban. So he asks Uncle Laban for her hand in marriage. And Uncle Laban says, fine, I need seven years of indentured servitude from you. Which was fine because he was so in love with Rachel. And the years just slipped by like months. And it came time then, the seven years were up. He went to Uncle Laban and says, it's now time to marry your daughter, and he says, you will. Well, you will marry my daughter. And that night, Laban brought his daughter into Jacob's tent. And the next morning, he found out it was not Rachel, it was Leah. And he hops up and he stomps over to Uncle Laban's tent and says, what is the meaning of this? He says, well, in our country, we always have to marry the oldest daughter first. Yeah. Gotcha. And he says, well, I, I want to ra marry Rachel. I said, well, that's fine. Now that my oldest daughter's married, you can marry Rachel. It'll just cost you another seven years of indentured servitude. So he made a deal. He actually put the seven years on credit. He married Rachel immediately after the honeymoon with, with Leah. And he worked the seven years, and it was a wonderful time. The two wives, I'm not so sure, but it was a wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> Read the rest of the story. It does not get much better. 
he says to Uncle Laban, I need to get some, some uh, sheep and goats from you. And, uh, and Uncle Laban says, fine, it'll just cause you seven more years of indentured servitude. And he works for seven more years. And he goes to Uncle Laban and says, I'm ready to get my sheep now. And he says, you can have all the ones that are spotted or striped. That is the inferior sheep and goats. So Jacob goes out and he... Gets, he starts an intentional breeding program to raise spotted and striped sheep and goats. And so he has hundreds of them by the time he's done with that program, and he takes them and heads back home. Well, of course, back home, there's Esau, his older brother, who wants to kill him. And they get to the river Jabbok, or Jabbok, and he knows that it's dangerous once he crosses that river. Esau may have his military guys coming, or he may come himself, kill Jacob at night, take from him his life. So he sends his wife and kids and, and everybody over on the other side of the river, over toward their home, and he stays behind. And that's where he has to encounter all of the things between <laughs> me and myself. Because he has spent his life living that ego self. Always about the past. Always about the future and never in the now. Now it's good we have egos. We couldn't do what we do without egos. But we get to thinking that's who we are. I think of myself, I am a preacher, I am a father, I am this, I am that. We always have a predicate. Well, the predicate is the ego, and we start to thinking that is who we truly are. And then we find out well, we are some things that we don't want to be. And we think we're stuck to that. And that defines us. But that's just the ego. And it takes over. It starts to, to base our lives on our past fears and, and successes, the things we did so wrong, the things we did so right. And then it starts looking at the future with nothing but fears and hopes. But it never is in the now. And what happened to Jacob was that he encountered the now in the shape of a man, an angel, of God, who wrestled with him. You ever have a night like that? Couldn't sleep? Everything going round and round and round and round in your head. It's your darn ego telling you all the things you've got to worry about and all the things you, you did wrong and, and what you should have said and round and round and round it goes. I had that happen when I was first meeting with my Board of Ordained Ministry Committee. And I tossed and I turned and I turned and I tossed, which was not very good for Sherry because we had a water bed at the time. I finally got up, got dressed, went out. We were in Genoa at the time. And everybody lives on the edge of town in Genoa. It's just the way it is. We wa I walked north of maybe a quarter mile until the town was about this big on the horizon. And the, the sky was clear. There was no moon. It was just a zillion stars. I tipped back, and I'm like I'm floating in space. And I look back down that little tiny strip of lights from the town, and I realized that this is all very small. This is all very small. Jacob, Jacob, the taker, he wants a blessing. It's going to be night, and uh, going to be light, I should say, and the, the, the angel wants to leave. God wants to leave because you can't see the face of God. You can't face the face of God. It's too much. So Jacob hangs on. I love this where he's, he's grabbing hold of him. Don't go away. Give me a blessing. Give me a blessing. Give me your birthright. Give me my blessing. Give me... Well, he's had problems with Uncle Laban, but he wants a blessing. He wants... I think this blessing is about being real in the here and now, and Jacob doesn't know how to do that. He wants somebody 
dad or an angel or God to make him real right now. And the, and the angel says, I can't. What is your name? He says, my name is the taker. He says, from now on, your name is the wrestler. He says, you wrestled with God. And it was real. That's what we're talking about. That is the freedom God offers us when we let go of the chain of the past and the chain of the, of the future. They have us pinned down. But what we seem to forget, what our minds forget, is that we are not manacled to those chains. We are holding them. And we can let go and just be who we are in the here, in the now, and in a way that I don't understand. I keep talking about it, but I don't understand. God is in the present with us, watching the world through us, living life in each and every one of us. And there's nothing you can do that is eternally wrong because you are dearly loved and you are dearly free. We have a hard time imagining how God could be in each one of us because we are so stuck in this bag of protoplasm. So what we do is we, we come to Jesus. We come down and invite Jesus in our lives or we come and we share Jesus in bread and wine, body and blood, and we take Jesus into ourselves. This is the, uh, the altar call, the ultimate altar call, having you come down and accept Christ and to let go of all those things that are chaining you down. For Christ is with you, and you are not alone. Really not alone.